Welcome to Do You Ever Wonder? The show that brings you answers to many of the questions that you may have, but with no one to ask. Do You Ever Wonder is hosted by Mike Holtman, CEO of Hallmark Abstract Service, who, like you, has always been deeply curious about a wide variety of topics. Each week, Mike will be speaking with guests who are leaders in their field and who have inspirational stories to tell. So now, sit back and enjoy the show. Hi everyone, this is Mike Haltman, and indeed today we do have a guest with a really very inspirational story to tell. Um, her name is Annie Nelson, and she is a, a lesson in perseverance, a lesson in resilience, and uh, really a lesson in advocacy. I mean, really, she really, she does it all, and I welcome Annie. Thank you. Absolutely. So, you've had quite a past that led you to where you are today. I know that you were a flight attendant. Yes. You were attacked on the plane by two men. Yes. And that left you with not only physical harm, but also PTS, which is, uh, you know, stays with us. Yeah, it's, uh, it's one of those things you uh, get to experience for uh, quite some time. Absolutely. So that left you with physical physical pain you've had uh you've had surgeries you've had cancer you've had concussions you've been through quite a bit and actually i did the brain tumors were not cancerous thankfully um oh. they were um they were dangerous but they were not cancerous well, thank god yes thank god but you did go through uh, uh the procedures twice Yes, I had one brain surgery that was 10 hours and 45 minutes to remove, which left wow. me deaf on the right side. And then I have some vision issues and I had to learn how to walk all over, talk all over, um, took my balance, took, uh, it was a journey. And then that was in 2010. And then fast forward to 2018, another one decided to uh, pop up. And that was a gamma knife procedure, which is, it's brain surgery, but it's done through laser technology. Right. And so um, the recovery is a lot quicker um, and you are awake, <laughs> awake for that one. So believe it or not, that one physically hurt more um, sure. because you're awake and they drill, they drill screws into your head and put on a halo. And um, yeah, that one, because when you're under, when they're cutting in for the 10 hour surgery, you're, you're asleep and you don't feel anything. And the, the skull actually, um, there's not a lot of nerves up there. I mean, there is, and I have pain now and I have headaches now because the plate that sits over here from the first surgery is actually sitting on my occipital minor nerve. Right. So that, um, I have some headache issues that I'll deal with. That's just what I call my new normal. So um, that'll stay with me forever. And of course, being deaf, I don't have it. Everybody's like, go oh, get a cochlear implant. I'm like, I can't because there's no nerve to attach it to. To wow. hear from that had to get removed to take the tumor back in 2010 so um yeah but you know it's, i'm here <laughs> no and you know what there's yeah. probably a reason that you're here you know you often yeah. you hear about people who survive some incredible things and and hopefully that they make the most of of the chances that they're given and i i think i think you have definitely done that you uh you work hard in a um in a genre that I'm very close to and I, I hold very dear, and that is working with military veterans who, mm -hmm. are, who are suffering. And, you know, you can kind of relate in some way. To, well, I think to... that's, um, for me, I have a very strong faith and I, I don't Bible thump anybody. I think it's a very individual journey, however you get there. Um, it's kind of a beautiful thing right now to see in our country so many people finding their faith or finding a stronger a stronger relationship with their faith. But for me, I was brought up that way. And I never, if you would have said, you know, back in college and when I was doing my thing, you're going to give up everything and you're going to just, you know, serve the veteran and military community for the rest of your adult life. I'd have laughed. I'm like, what? Right. You know, <laughs> I'm like, excuse me, huh? Um, that would have been like, no, I didn't know. A, I didn't know anything about the veteran and military community. Um, I'm an only child. My dad was 16 years older than my mom. He was drafted, but he was too tall to serve back in his day. So yeah, he was six eight, and shoot, he's been gone twenty two years already now. Um, 
My mom had two brothers. They were older. They served, but they never spoke about their service. It was a very different era back then where, you know, people just didn't, they didn't talk about their service. And so where, I didn't. Where I grew have up they a, served? Yeah. I mean, I grew up no, in a very where? patriotic home, but nobody, nobody spoke about what they did, where they went or, you know, yeah. where, I just where, didn't know anything about it. Your, your relatives who did serve, where, where what, what conflict were they in? Uh, Korea, the Korean war. So, um, you know, my, I actually have my mom's oldest, well, both of my mom's brothers that served are now passed away. I had one, uh, un uncle that was a cook in the army. And then I had another uncle who, um, served and, and I don't still know a lot about what he actually did because he never talked about what he did. Um, but he, um, they both served honorably. They both did their time. They both were army, um, and they still, I mean, even though now looking back, I never, I never asked, you know, I never asked those questions. I have a dear friend who's kind of like a second dad who was a Korean war veteran. And we don't talk about what he saw or did to this day. We don't, he talks, he knows what I do. He's very appreciative of what I do. He's um, a wonderful, wonderful gentleman who, you know, got out of the service, went on and led a, a stellar career with polar generators and is a, is a, patriotic human being and a wonderful human being and who's done just tremendous in his life has a family grandchildren great grandchildren but i i never asked i don't i don't ask well they yeah i mean a lot of times you don't ask and they don't really want to offer because the <laughs> the trauma of whatever it is you know i work with combat vets suffering moral injury mm -hmm. and probably that's probably what a lot of these guys are suffering with the things well, that, and a lot of it, I've noticed um, generally generationally I did a white paper years ago actually during the 2016 administration when we were we were studying veteran suicide a lot and um, wasn't really talked about as much as it is now but and unfortunately it's not talked about enough um, and when I dug in and I hadn't written a white paper golly, since college. I mean, it, it back in the day, but I had been asked to write it. And when I had gone back to do that, you know, you really have to take apart each era of service. And so many of the organizations nowadays, if you really dig into their service and what they're doing for the veteran community, they all, and specifically on their websites and in their, in their mission statements and vision statements, they say post 9-11 veterans only. So they will only serve the post 9-11 veteran community. Well, we have a lot of veterans that are Desert Storm, you know, Vietnam veterans, which is a wonderful generation of veterans that have Agent Orange and have so many different things that they're tackling mm -hmm. that a lot of the orgs that have a lot of the money today are not helping the veteran Vietnam veteran era. And we're losing these guys right and left. And sadly, they're not getting the, the respect or the service that they still deserve as far as resources and help that they desperately need. And oh, so God. if you look about the moral injury and the invisible wounds that these guys are given and and that it lasts a lifetime and that their families go through, it's not just the vet that is, you know, dealing with a lot of these invisible wounds. It's the family members, it's the caregivers, it's the children, it's everybody. It's the entire family that serves, not just the veteran. So it's the entire family that needs to be embraced and supported. And you have to really break it down to each era and each place that was served because every single battle and every single battlefront is different. And what every single person went through and where they were and where they've served is different. However, if you break down today's younger generation of suicides in the veteran community, a lot of them have non they've never been to combat so how do you explain that in the moral injury space and then if you go and you look at like the wounded warrior battalion that's on base not the wounded warrior project that's a nonprofit organization but the wounded warrior battalions that are the the facilities that are on base let's say in the marine corps there's there's a few of these places that's called the wounded warrior battalion where if you're a combat wounded ill or injured sa sailor or marine you go there when you cannot serve your unit and you know the reason you're in the military is to be deployable and that's what a lot of people forget you know you you don't go to the military to hang out you go to be deployed and if you can't be deployed and be with your unit you need to go get healthy so that you can be deployable and so they go to the wounded warrior battalion well so many of the quote-unquote mental health cases that are currently being um adhered to or treated right now a ton of them are schizophrenic 
why today, in today's day and age, do we have such an abundance of schizophrenia? When you and I were young, we didn't, we didn't have it. We didn't talk about it. We didn't see it. But we have an abundance of schizophrenia diagnoses right now. You can't recruit that out of the military at today's day and age because it doesn't even pop until you're 21 to 25 years old. And you're recruiting 17 and 18 year olds. So these are, these are, are soldiers who come in not suffering schizophrenia and then all of a sudden it develops. Boom. Yeah. Really? Well, yeah, because when you're recruiting, you're recruiting 17 and 18 year olds. Right. You don't have the symptoms. You don't have the the warning sign. And then realize... when you're already in. Yeah, and no, I didn't realize schizophrenia didn't appear until later typically on. Typically 21 to 25. Wow. Yeah. Wow. And now yeah. we as a military have that we have to take care of. I mean, you don't just abandon them. So what do they do? Drugs? I guess. I mean, I'm not a doctor. I'm not a psychiatrist. Right. I'm not somebody that knows how to, you know, take care of that. But I'm just saying, why now? And why is there such an abundance of it happening? And then you look at device addiction. Device addiction is happening all across the world. If we just break it down to the U.S., because suicides are up across the board, not just in the veteran populace. But if you look at device addiction and all the seminars I've gone to and all of the podcasts I've listened to and all of the doctors I've spoken to, our brains are not wired to be electronic devices. Our brains are wired for human interaction and human connection. And if you are on a device, every hour you're on a device, your brain is putting out chemicals of depression. And so if you sit on a phone or if you sit on a laptop or if you sit on a computer, or if you sit on a, a gaming device, electronics for eight hours a day, that's eight hours of chemical doping that you're putting into wow. your brain just from your natural body mechanism. So we are feeding our brains with depression naturally. And then you go home at night and you'll have people that'll take a beer, drink a glass of wine, take an antidepressant because they can't figure out why they're so depressed. Because we are raising a generation of depressed kids. We're raising a generation of depressed adults. Then we go and we unwind with depressants. And then people are wondering why they're walking around in a fog and they're bummed and they're depressed. And everything you see in the news or on social media is not social. It's depression and it's depressive things. And then you throw politics in the mix, which that's not exactly an uplifting, cheery topic. And it's impacting no, it's everybody. No, it's it, it is scary. I mean, I know that the young people suicide rate is up and it's. And they say New York City is one of the loneliest places in, in the world. Yeah. Because people are, pe pe like you said, people stay in, they look on their phones, they play social media. There's no more, kids don't know how to talk to each other. Well, you go to, you go to schools nowadays and they're raised, their kids aren't going to school to learn from a blackboard and a pen and a paper. Kids don't even know how to write cursive. Kids are going to school to learn on computers or go to a computer lab. Yep. So we're raising, we're raising dummy down kids and we're raising brains that are being raised in, in depression state for the youth. And then we're going to recruit depressed people into a military and we're supposed to train them to be warriors and war fighters and men and women that are going to be mentally strong and tough to handle what's going to be coming at them in a, in a society and in a world that's falling apart. That's you know what? Uh, it that sounds very depressing, but I, I have to agree with you 100. percent But so it's not. On, a, on a brighter subject, tell tell us about in 2004, you you met a marine. I met three. Three. <laughs> yeah. Three marines. Yeah. And you. I was actually at. Well, I started the nonprofit um, back in '96 when I was a flight attendant. I got beat up by passengers, and they broke my back and ended my flying career. And I was down rehabbing and I was volunteering for the Ronald McDonald House Charities, which was the nonprofit of the airline that I flew for while I was rehabbing. And in that in that time, I was at the host, children's hospitals because that's where Ronald McDonald House Charities is next to. And I saw all these kids that were in the hospitals and they were terminal. And I would go to the gentleman that managed the Ronald McDonald House Charities and I'd be like, hey, how come all these kids are by themselves? And he's like, well, because. You know, kids that are terminal, mom and dad can't sit there 24 seven because they still have to have a job and they have other children and there's all these different things. So in order for my friends and I to be able to go and hang out with these kids when we had time, you had to be an organized group. 
you couldn't just show up back then and this was in 95 96 to hang out with kids and give them time and support children that were terminal and then my other passion at the time was seniors that you know a lot of people back then and still sometimes today you'll see a lot of people just dump off their senior citizens and senior citizen homes and they don't go back and visit so you have a lot of older people that are lonely and so we formed a nonprofit with no intention of raising money, just to raise time. And we went to hang out and support children that were terminal and seniors that were in senior citizens' homes lonely. So we did that. Fast forward to 9-11 happened, and I wanted to do something for the veteran space, but I didn't know what to do. And so I was at a family reunion in Illinois, and about one of my cousins was dating a young Marine that was stationed at Camp Pendleton, which I was living in Orange County, California at the time. I'm now in Tennessee. Um, and she was dating a Marine, and he and his cousin and his buddy were all three stationed at Camp Pendleton, which is right down the road from me, and they were all over in Fallujah. And um, I said I could pen pal, so give me their addresses. And my great-grandfather and my grandfather, who I'd never met, because they my dad's age difference, they were already deceased when I was born, they served for actually us. Um, and so I thought, well, I can pen pal. So I started writing these young Marines and one of them, because of his MOS or his job at that time in Iraq, he could spend more time writing back. The other two were on the front lines and they couldn't write back as much. But Jesse and I started to write as much as we could. And then back then we didn't have smartphones and all this kind of stuff. We had right. AOL Instant Messenger and we had pen and paper. So between AOL Instant Messenger and if he could get on AOL Instant Messenger and pen and paper, I started supporting these three young guys and we um, became really good buddies, never met them in person at the time and got pens and cards and letters and it was really kind of fun. And then all my friends and family started kind of getting hooked on this little pen pal ship and everybody wanted to become a part of it. So the letters became packages, the packages became boxes, the boxes started to get larger and my friends, my family, my church, everybody started to get in on the action and um it was just real organic in the way it grew. And then in December of 04, I was notified through one of the guys over there on AOL Instant Messenger that Jesse and Ty were sitting in a caravan of five trucks going across Fallujah and they were hit by a suicide bomber. And um, yeah, and Ty was in Germany in really bad shape. And then I, I was told at the time that Jesse didn't make it. And, you know, it was it was weird because like for six months, they were my extracurricular activity. I had, right. you know, that was kind of my thing. And um, being that I wasn't in the military, I didn't, I didn't know how to really process that. Cause I had, I, I wasn't their family. I was just a pen pal and I didn't, I, I had never lost anybody, but I mean, they, they were just, to me, they were like family, but they weren't, you know, and um, I didn't know how to, kind of gr grieve them because I had never really m met them. Like I hadn't even okay. talked to them like you and I are communicating, you know, it was just, like I said, pen and paper. And so I thought about it and I figured out like because of my cousin, I knew um, how to get in you know, touch with Jesse's folks. And so I just went to Hallmark and I was trying to find a sympathy card, but there weren't really any appropriate ones if you've never met somebody in person. Right. So I got a thank you card because I thought, well, I could get a thank you for your family service card type of thing. And I bundled up all my letters that I had received from their son. And I sent a thank you card for your family service. And I did not mention that I knew what had happened. I just thought that if I was the mom of a 19 year old boy, um, that this would be a really nice keepsake to have of all of his letters to this stranger, basically. And so I shipped them up and I sent them to his folks in Illinois. And then I went and sent stuff to Tyler in Germany because I knew he was at the hospital and just kind of, kept sending stuff to Adam who was still deployed as far as I knew right. and we went through Christmas and New Year's and then um about two weeks into 05 my cell phone rang and it was a woman's voice and she was kind of short and kind of stern and she said hey this is Paula Jesse's mom and as you can tell I'm just such an introvert <laughs> mm. I was like oh my gosh hi how are you and I was like zero to 90 you know and um she said, I'm at Brook Army Medical Center. Jesse survived that blast. He's facing double amputation. He's burnt over, uh, I think it was like 80% of his body, and he's asking for his pen pal. Will you come? Oh, wow. Yeah. Wow. 
And the girl that had no experience with the veteran community or had never been in a VA or ever stepped foot in a military hospital, um, God had a plan and life was about to change. So, so you went and saw him. Yeah. The, um, be... at, back then, the Marine Corps through the Semper Fi Fund flew me to San Antonio and I stayed at the Fisher House and I went, um, yeah, and Tyler was back, was there at the time and Jesse was there. That had and, to be um, very traumatic, traumatic um, on one level. Yeah, um, you're not prepared for anything like that. Back then, we were bringing home men because women weren't on the, the front line back then like they are now um, for for one big difference that you know how far we've come from 0405 to 2024 um we've also for this for this conflict which i knew i knew none of this back then i mean i didn't know protocol i didn't know there was a difference in branches that you didn't call a marine a soldier i didn't know i didn't know squat but um we also had medics that were so advanced for the first time that they were saving guys on the front lines in in horrific conditions that they would have never been able to save in previous conflicts and the the type of wars that that we were fighting were so different and so graphic and the burns and the amputations and the just everything was so much more intense um that our guys were coming home with that it was so it was amazing to be able to see how advanced we were and how how we were able to save these guys and and that they were able to have a life and that they were able to come home um but you're not you're not ready to like knowing that you have no military knowledge or 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 even prepared that that's a, a possibility to be there when they arrive it yeah it was over it was overwhelming but it was um it was like a huge blessing too. I mean, just to be able to support them. Is uh, is Jesse still alive today? He is. He's a single leg amputee below the knee. He's married. He has kids. He's, wow. um, yeah, he's he's just amazing. And he and his wife have a beautiful life in Illinois. And yeah, it's That's pretty phenomenal. fun to watch. So have you uh, stayed in touch with his mom or is that like? Everybody. His sister's married. She's got kids. They're playing football. Um, he and his wife, like I said, have a beautiful life. His mom and dad. Um, Tyler, unfortunately, eight years after um, he came home, they were all the boys got together at Christmas and they were at a place called Sue's and they came out afterwards and um, it was in a bad storm and Ty slipped on a piece of ice and hit his head where his injury was and we wow. lost him. Yeah. And then Adam is Border Patrol currently, and he's married with children, and um, they're all growing up in high school, and That's he and phenomenal. my cousin got married, and yeah. So, I mean, your your attachment and association is is incredible. But yeah. Out of, but out of that, you the... Um, the out of that pen pal ship was born the American Soldier Network, and out of that, we have touched over 23,000 lives that we know of. Wow. Yeah. It's phenomenal. You know, God had uh, a plan. Yeah, I mean, you've done you've done God's work. And it was Him. So, are you? How does your five hundred one c three work? How do you fund it? How do you? Oh, it's all private. We have zero paid staff. I've never taken. Nobody's ever taken a paycheck. So it's all volunteer, which is kind of crazy. Um, but it's coming from zero to to where we are today and watching different um, nonprofits make a boatload of money and see where the money goes. Um, I was determined not to let that happen with us. Um, in the beginning, A, being a civilian entering this space before it was, I say before it was cool, because back when we were in this, um, nobody was, I mean, yeah, there was the Bob Hope, you know, in the USO and, you know, people doing that kind of thing. But all these, there wasn't over 45,000 registered nonprofits doing stuff in the veteran space, which now there is. Um, 
And so we never raised a boatload of money because we always were doing things on, on brain. I call it brain health instead of mental health uh, because of what I lived through. And PTS, I fought for years. To, it was back way back when. I don't know if anybody remembers. It was post-traumatic stress syndrome. It wasn't post-traumatic stress disorder. And I fought for years to get rid of the S. We finally did that and they slapped a D on it. And those are because of insurance insurance companies need to diagnose these so that they'll pay for stuff. It has, it's not a syndrome. It's not a disorder. It's post-traumatic stress. And then nobody's even talking about PTSG, post-traumatic growth. So I mean, PTG, excuse me, not PTSG, but post-traumatic growth. And so there's just so much misunderstood and misrepresentation about the brain and what happens when you go through trauma, whether you're a civilian or whether you're in the veteran space. And as far as I'm concerned, every human on the planet has stuff. There is not a human alive that has not gone through stuff and how we choose to deal with our stuff is how you're going to go through the rest of your life. Nobody needs to have it be a life sentence. It's uh, it's interesting. I went to, you know, I work with with the Heroes to Heroes Foundation. We work with, you know, traumatic brain injury, moral injuries. And uh, one exercise we did, we went away with some of the participants and they had to write about their their personal uh, stress, you know, yeah. their, their personal. And I was there as the board chair. I had to write about it too. And you know, you think about um, about that, and it's like I never served. Right. But that doesn't mean that I don't have post traumatic yeah. stress. I mean, I I wrote about my childhood, which, yeah. you know, in my own way, just like in your own way, it, it's, it's long lasting and, and are things that we have to learn how to, to deal with. Yeah, absolutely. 100%. And it's crazy because like, okay, so for example, if you're talking about animals and dogs, and you see dogs chained up that look you know, malnutritioned and they've got flies all over them. I mean, they can tug at the heartstrings. If you see burn victims or amputees, you can use the images and it tugs at the heartstrings. And you'll see a lot of the nonprofits out there use vision and images to raise money and tug at the heartstrings, or you'll see a celebrity presence. And you, you can't take a picture of a brain and raise money. And so when you're trying to raise money on an invisible wound and the power of the brain and how, I mean, you suicide and mental health is a hard, a hard nut to it's raise hard, money on. It just, I always, uh, I always talk about how those commercials, there's one for uh, children with cancer. Yeah. Uh, the Danny Thomas hospital. Yep. And, and it, and the ASPCA commercial, I mean, yep. they ripped me apart. Yep. And I always say, you know, it's hard. It's, it's very hard to, Everyone's got their passionate cause. Hundred percent, and I'm not saying they're bad no, at of course all. Not. I'm just of saying. Course. And the other thing that is frustrating, and I because I I was an executive director for a, a nonprofit that had nothing to do with the veteran space years ago, before I ever you know did this. And um, in the veteran space, the thing that's really tough, and I just had a conversation with somebody this morning about this. If all of the nonprofits in the veteran space that have hundreds of millions of dollars, which there are several nonprofits that have hundreds of millions of dollars in the bank account, would collaborate with a lot of us that don't have a lot of big bank accounts. And in the grant making process, a lot of grant funders will not grant small nonprofits the grants they need unless they have big money in bank accounts. So it's a very, it's a very screwed up industry I think, if you're really trying to make a difference in the lives of others. Um, and I think there's, you know, everybody has good um, as far as what they're trying initially. And I think, you know, the bigger some orgs get, I get it. You got to have staff. I get it that, I mean, we've been around since, well, technically 1994. We've been doing it for the veteran space since 2007. We reformed and, you know, did a DBA and now we're all veteran. Um and we became all suicide prevention in 2017, 18. Um, and we're still doing it with, you know, hardly any money in all volunteer space. And yet we still like our rockup.org site, which is a collaborative effort. And we are out there basically raising awareness for 
a boatload of others, and they don't even know we're raising awareness for them at, on mm -hmm. our money, you know? Like, our whole effort is to try to let the veterans know there is so much out there for you outside of the VA because Absolutely. the trust within the VA system is lost in the veteran space. So I, I was actually going to ask you to include my charity in your aid station. Yeah. Well, the aid station, yeah, as long as there's treatment at the foundation. See, because mm -hmm. the aid station is about treatment facilities, not just .orgs. So it has to provide treatment services to go into the aid station. They And they can't be and this is not to degrade anybody's hunting, fishing, excursion type situations. Hunting, fishing, excursions, getaways are phenomenal day trips. The aid station is where you need to do the work. And you need to do the work with trained professionals because that's where you're going to heal. And take it from me, <laughs> it's years of work to heal the brain. And it's an ongoing thing. It's not an overnight switch, nor is it a one-size-fits-all Band-Aid. I know there's a lot of talk right now on psychedelics. I'm going to mention it just because everybody thinks, oh, one-stop shop, go do psychedelics. Not true. And you still need to do the work after if you're going to dabble in the psychedelic world. They're, um, I'm not saying they're bad. I'm not saying they're good. I'm not well, endorsing no, them. But it's, uh, yeah, everyone's looking for the quick fix, whether exactly. it's Ozempic and, to lose weight or psychedelics to, to make you whole again. Correct. And unless you're going to work on the soul and you're going to work on the brain, you're not going to heal. It's you got to heal the whole body and the whole person, and you have to heal the family along with it. You can't send an individual yeah. that's suffering from PTS off to get help. And then have them come home and put them into a family that's been suffering right along with them and expect the family to heal. Because so, if the family doesn't heal together with the person that's been suffering, you're going to put the person that was at the highest peak of stress with an upset brain into the back into the highest peak of stress with people that now don't know the person. So it's interesting. We And I'll, I'll send you a video we took at our, our most recent fundraising event with one of our vets who was talking very emotionally about the impact on his family and how, you know, my organization helped his family to heal. But we, you know, part of our year long program is sending vets on team journeys to Israel where mm -hmm. they reconnect with their faith, you know, they regain spirituality. But at the same time, we work with their wives back here letting them know what it is that they're doing. Because as you said, a lot of times the vets go on, on vacations and come home and the wife's like, you know, where the hell have you been? I've been here dealing with the kids. And, you know, any any help is just mitigated. So it's, right. it, as you said, it's very important for the family to heal right along with them. Well, and nine times out of 10, the spouse has PTS right along with the husband. 100%. And so, you know, it's a whole, it's a, it's a whole can of worms. But um, what I've seen from the bulk of the typically ideal, or I get the phone calls, and unfortunately, I'm not a licensed psychologist, nor do I ever pretend to be, nor do I know what it's like to go downrange. Um, and I have never served. I'm a civilian, and I never pretend to understand that. Um I've gotten a lot of phone calls where, you know, they'll call me in the middle of the night and, or in the middle of the afternoon and, you know, so-and-so will be in a bad, in a bad place with a yep. bad situation. And, you know, it's they want me to try to yeah. talk him down. And, um, thankfully I've never lost anybody on my watch. Not that it was my watch, but, um, when that phone calls come in, we've had, um, we've had success. Um, but you know, there's gotta be more in my opinion, and it's just my opinion after over 20 years of doing this. Um, and again, it's for me, it's been God doing this through me and not me. I'm not anybody special. I just accepted the role when it was presented. <laughs> I mean, um, you're special to the extent that you care and you are doing it. A lot of people. Thank you. But I mean, I don't, it's just been, for me, it's just been, um, it's been a journey that was pointed out through, through, through God for me. Um, and that's all, that's the only way I can explain it. And that's like, when I did the book, I had no intention of ever writing a book. And then 
everybody had said, you've got to do it, you've got to do it. And it was a stop, start, stop, start. And, and then it finally came out there. And now it's really, it's kind of emotional when you get letters of people that, you know, your book made a huge difference. And that if it, if it helped one person, it was amazing. And now that it's making an impact for others, it's, it's, you know, that's, it, again, that was God's thing. It wasn't. <laughs> well, you know what, we're, we're, we're running out of time, but, uh, you know, you have done what many people don't do. And you. You know, I think you should be very proud of what it is you've accomplished because, Thanks. you know, you, you, like you said, you've changed lives, you've saved lives, you've saved families and, you know, that's just incredible. So it's a, it's a, it's a collaborative effort. I mean, it takes a lot of people, but I just want people that, that are out there to know that, you know, you have to ask for help. You can't do it by yourself. And if you're a veteran, um, you deserve the help that's out there. And there's so much of it out there. You just yep. have to find it and you don't have to go to the VA. I mean, yeah, RuckUp is, is you know, RuckUp.org has the aid station and we're, we're constantly looking for different things to put in the aid station. We don't just throw it in there if we don't know that they're veteran friendly. Right. No, no doubt. You know what? Yeah. God bless you. And oh, thank somebody, you. And if somebody wanted to get in touch, how would they how would they do that? Oh, all of my social media and it's the Annie Nelson just because Annie Nelson was already taken. It's not, so it's the Annie Nelson at Instagram, at X, at Facebook. Um, the nonprofit is you know American Soldier Network. Our American Soldier Network Instagram is you know American Soldier Network on Instagram. Our X is for our troops. Um, our email is um, for our troops at Proton Mail because we have to try to keep everything a little bit more secure because right. of the issues that we deal with. But um, I'm Annie at the American Soldier Network dot org. Um, it's we're pretty easy to find. Fantastic. You yeah. Know, Annie, Annie, thank you for coming on. I really appreciate it. Thanks for having it. me. Oh, absolutely. I didn't get to ask you about everything, but you'll come back on again. And, and anytime, we'll everything. anytime and, and keep up the fantastic work. You're you a, too. Uh, you're an angel. Oh, thank you so much. Absolutely. Thank you for listening to Do You Ever Wonder? And we hope that you enjoyed the show. Next week, we will have another terrific guest telling their story. And if there are any specific topics you'd like to hear more about, please don't hesitate to let us know. Our curiosity, like yours, knows no bounds. Please subscribe and like and share this episode on your social media. See you next week. My leg fell asleep. <laughs> <laughs> uh...